this computer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, it's been a while since I've used Zoom. <laughs> Share wow. is is uh, that run your cursor on the bottom, and there's a a um, green. Yes. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Yep. Entire screen. Should do. Yeah. Share that, and we'll do here. And yep, there. you're sharing. There you go. Already. Perfect. Okay. Alrighty, let's get going. So I'm Kobe. I'm Evan. And I'm Braden. We are the Gallatin High Micro Rover team, more informally known as Blue, Blue Moon. Moon. Now, now obviously we we actually had like a little spiel prepared in case we weren't like the first team. So Thanks. we we've prepared two sets of slides, one that goes over like the criteria of our project and another that goes over our current progress. So we were just wondering if you would want us to skip the criteria and go straight to the progress or if you want the whole thing. Yeah, no, we know the criteria and yeah, you I are the think, first I one. I think you guys can bypass that part. <laughs> Alrighty, we'll skip ahead then. All righty. So we have come up with two rover designs. On the left is rover one, scorpion bot, and on the right is rover two, lizard bot. They both operate on two wheels and a tail for stability with an inlaid pocket for a drone camera. Rover one, scorpion bot, is a more complex design that folds up to maximize our space given and has retractable tail and wheel base. And we have a separate wheel design, which we haven't added into here because we haven't finished modeling. That also folds up. If you'd like to see that, we have a little demonstration here. Yeah, but we basically, it's basically like that, but we have six of those into like. And it folds out mm -hmm. like that, kind of like spurs. So mm -hmm. we can't see what you're holding in your hand. So when, after you finish your uh, PowerPoint, well, we want to see that, definitely. Understood. <laughs> so for Rover 2, the lizard bot, it's a more robust design for a higher impact. It's a more resilient robot, and it's more simple with a lot less moving parts. So it can handle a lot more. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so similar to our robots, we actually have two ejection systems that can be used with either either or. Now, to the left here, we have the crane drop system. This was the system that we envisioned starting out. We were we wanted to create the most accurate drop down system possible. So what we what we've been working on is basically a system of complex expanding supports that are based in like the top roof of our container. And from there, the supports basically extend yeah. out like a full two and a half feet. And then they pull the robot along, obviously. And then they drop the robot down exactly in the specific drop zone that NASA envisions us to do. Now, obviously, the downside of this is that it has many moving parts. So we also decided to create the piston ejection system to our right, which is basically a simple backup. Now, the piston injection system uses a single-use canister, not a CO2 canister, like an actual canister of air that, it, that has like a control mechanism that is controlled by a small Arduino. So we have the canister, and then it releases the oxygen into the two chambers that then propel two pistons forward, launching the robot outside of the container and onto the lunar regolith. Um, so we have been developing our electronic system simultaneously with our designs, with the exception of the um, video system, which has just arrived, um, and the air valve, which we are currently debating the benefits of adding. Now, we... We weren't sure how long this slide was going. These slides were going to be. We weren't sure if we were going to go over the criteria or not. So we left a little bit of a buffer space here with the Q and A, where basically we could e exit out and go over 
the various aspects of the project that you want to know about? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so stop no, sharing unless yeah, you want to see sharing. Dave. Do you yeah, want to sh- show us? Show us yeah. what you got, guys. Already. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and Nancy oh. Hall just join, is joining us too. She's our go. Glenn Research uh, microgravity engineer. Um, so Hi, Nancy. <laughs> okay, go right. ahead. Share, put it right up to the camera. All, All right. right, so this is like part of the wheel that we have right here. It's oh, for robot number one, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's um contains gears, right? This gear um is basically like a claw or it's kind of like a like a spur. Yeah, and, and there's six of them goes around in a circle, yeah, fold and, it up. And they yeah. fold like this, right? And so basically, right, six of them is meant to like basically make make it look like a wheel, right? Um, but this is, these things are meant for traction, right? And so it goes, you know, goes like that. It, goes, and, it expands out and yeah. then it becomes like a claw that can dig into the lunar regolith and propel our robot forward. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Big. That's the scorpion robot, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. So what, what we've been trying to do with our design process is we've made two versions of everything. One, the complex version that we've been working really hard on and hope to hope to show NASA, and, and the simplified version that we can fall back on if for some reason we get delayed. Okay. <laughs> well, that's thinking ahead. Good. Do yep. you have anything else to show us there? Well, we actually have some of the components here that we are we are considering using in our rover that we'd like to show you. Sure. So first of all, we have just these little motors. So I just actually had these at home, so I just brought them in. So this here is just a simple, small DC motor. Not really much to it. It it really isn't very like special, but it is lightweight. It weighs exactly like half an ounce. So with two of these, we have like one ounce of weight, which is pretty acceptable for the system that's gonna drive our rover. And then we also have, we actually just, like my associate just said, we actually just got like the video system. And so our video system, basically what we're doing is we're adapting technology that's used in drone racing. So this here is what we refer to as as the, well, actually this here is what we refer to as an FPV camera, first person view. The idea is for drones is that people flying drones can basically like put on like a VR headset and then just like see exactly out of the drone's viewpoint. Now, obviously we aren't going to be wearing VR headsets for this, but uh, the technology is pretty similar and it's very small, compact and reliable. So we've just gone ahead and adapted it. Okay. Okay. So I remember I was really, um, uh, sad that when I got to visit you, you were on the kind of the wrong track. <laughs> you thought it was going to be a remote control um, uh, robot. But now I really appreciate that you switched gears, so mm-hmm. to speak, and, and are working on uh, an autonomous robot. Um, are any of you familiar then with the Arduino and the... Yep. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Well, we'll let Dave and Nancy make any comments. Go for it. Dave. Um, so it, you you look like you have a lot of your um, components for the system already in place. Mm-hmm. Now, have you tallied up the total mass of everything that you have so far to know how much it's going to weigh? Yep. So for the, like I said, we've already... We've weighed some of the components. Like we haven't weighed these yet. We just got these. Okay. We're gonna work on those, and then we've. What I'm actually thinking for these is if they're a little overweight, what we will probably do is just like strip off the casings, and just like wrap, and just like, do them like naked electronics. <laughs> sure. Okay. Then I understood. Um, yes. And and what what material are you gonna use for the body of your robot? That's a question that we were going to ask. What's a a low budget material that's would be good for our rover that can also withstand the heat of the lunar surface? Yeah. Well, so 
here, here's the thing, guys. I want you to keep in mind that you're building a prototype, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have no expectation that you're going to construct something that would be of the, the same material grade that you'd be sending to the surface of the moon. Now, clearly, it would be nice to have the research and your recommendations on what you what you think that material is. But we have to be practical about this, right? So I'm assuming that you're planning on printing um, something uh, in-house, right? And that, I'm, I'm, a, I'm guessing you're going to use a plastic analogous to ABS or something of that nature, right? That's, that, that's, that's perfectly fine. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. So, uh, uh, but again, you're you're going to have to factor in what is the weight of the that plastic going to add mm -hmm. to all of your other components. Um, yeah. The whole idea here being, you've got 15 ounces total, mm -hmm. right? And it looks to me like you're going to easily be within the, that kind of constraint. But mm -hmm. it, it's good that you have all this stuff and you can start adding all of this up to give yourself a sense of, you know, how much how much flexibility are you going to have? Um, because, again, once you once you start getting this built and begin dropping it a few times, mm -hmm. the, <laughs> you may find that you're going to have to you're going to have to beef it up a little bit. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I'm probably telling you something you already know. But my suggestion is the first time you drop this, don't put your components in there. <laughs> put something in there of a similar mass because you, you, you don't, you know, you spent money on the electronics and stuff. I'd hate for you to, to end up trashing this stuff unnecessarily. Um, so just, just make sure that you're, that you're testing this initially with, you know, some kind of analog for all of that electronics um the 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 other comment that 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 I want to share is with with your ejection ejection system mm -hmm. um my bias on this is keep it as simple as possible um you it it even sounds like you've come up with a pretty complex um delivery system and you can probably simplify that even more. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, and if you go to the to the project description on the design and prototype website, mm -hmm. the very last slide now basically has a brief description of what your demonstration requirements are and what the what the mentors and other people should be looking for and it's a real you know basically yes or no checklist did the robot do this yes no etc right um the idea being that at the critical design review um the idea will be to have something like a small you know, plastic wading pool with enough sand inside of it to serve as that surface you're landing on mm -hmm. with a tower set at six feet. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you don't need to think about ejecting this with a lot of force. Essentially, if you can get it out of the box and it drops, it's gonna land in that target zone, right? The yep. key here is it's gotta survive a six foot drop. And then it's got to be oriented properly so that it can show movement. Now, in the original project description, there was a reference to, um, can this drive 100 feet? Well, the reality is the objective of this is much more basic than that. Theoretically, what we would like to have is something that is ejected out of the robot or out of the rocket while it's in the process of landing. And then the robot is going to be able to basically turn around and take images of that landing itself, mm -hmm. right? So we don't need to get 100 feet away. And, and plus, you don't have that much time, right? You're not going to be able to drive 100 feet, turn around before this rocket actually hits the surface. 
So the whole idea is you want to show mobility, you want to show some directionality and be able to capture an image. And in fact, that's pretty complicated. There's a mm -hmm. lot of things that are happening in a pretty compact period of time. So keep some of this as simple as you can. Something that, you know, picture a box that you've constructed with a door that has a hinge on it and some kind of a latch. What you will be allowed to do is once the box is sitting on the platform, you can kind of flip the the latch so that the door can then swing open mm -hmm. now if the robot is mounted inside that box against a spring and that spring is loaded mm -hmm. with the door closed well obviously as soon as you release the latch the spring is going to go and everything's good you know the robot's going to come out and drop um that's about as simplistic as you can make it. And you don't need to make it more complicated than that. You're just, you're, you're adding more levels of a design challenge with adding in compressed gases and other things. So my, my sense is, you know, it's, it's a noble idea, but you've got a lot to do, right? True. <laughs> so, so don't, don't, don't overcomplicate it with, a, you know, a, a really uh, high tech delivery system there. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, th those are my basic suggestions at this point. They were yeah, excellent. You've got, some, you, you, you've got some great design <laughs> ideas there. And the way I'm picturing this, especially in that second prototype you had, mm -hmm. where essentially it kind of looks like the body is, you know, configured in a way that it doesn't really matter what way it lands, right? Rounded. No matter how this thing is going to come down, it's going to fall on one side or another, and you have an up and a down, right? <laughs> and, and even if the camera is oriented upside down, as long as you can capture an image, well, you can imagine you could flip that, you could flip the image over on a screen with no problem at all. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. huh? Okay. Nancy, what are your thoughts? Let me unmute. Yeah, I came in late, so I didn't see a lot of it, but I agree with all yours. And that's, I tell my students the same thing. Use the materials you have on, on hand. Use that to... Um, uh basically um come up with the listing but like dave said is if you know what material should be used on the moon and you can get an estimate of that that uh weight using that material that's also good to do too otherwise the individual parts i saw look good so that's basically my main uh, <laughs> comments there well thank you yes yeah, so if you look at the new requirements it says 30 seconds that your robot um demonstrates mobility as 30 mm -hmm. seconds instead of 100 feet which is a big a big difference right yeah. um yep. <laughs> so and the 15 ounces is for your the weight of your robot but um your question what material that that's the question we want you guys to answer so that's research. What material should NASA use? You've got 15 ounces. NASA will probably, when you look at their material, will probably be six ounces. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I do love, I do love your models. They're pretty cool. They're they're really cool. I love that you have the scorpion and lizard both of them too. But I would definitely listen to exactly what um, Dave described and try to just use the spring. In actuality, hunch students make CubeSat deployers and guess what deploys them from a tube into space? A spring. A spring. <laughs> a spring. <laughs> you can't get more simple than <laughs> Yeah. Guys, let, what, one final comment for you. Um, when you get to any level of testing. And again, what I would suggest is print your body in whatever configuration you choose. Um, 
put enough weight in there to compensate for all of your electronics, your motors, et cetera, and start dropping this thing. And when you do, make sure that you're videotaping mm -hmm. all of that testing. And the reason I say that is after years of having done this, I've learned that when it comes to CDR, Murphy's Law will <laughs> control the day. There will be teams that show up who have had tremendous success and fulfilled every requirement. And then on the day of the CDR, everything blows up on you, right? Your, your motors don't work. Your, you know, whatever the case may be, I don't want you to feel that if you aren't able to demonstrate this at the critical review, you fail. As long as you have good documentation that supports all of the different design requirements, you're still a contender. You're, you know, we can go in and look at that data. And ultimately, that's going to have to be the case anyway. You know, mm -hmm. this is and, a really popular project this year. Yeah. There's probably going to be a hundred <laughs> contenders and we're going to have, you know, we're going to have probably 25 that are all performing every part of the task. So then it becomes, how do you whittle that down to yeah. five finalists? It's going to be going back in and looking at all of that mm -hmm. test data to support, you know, the design that you came up with. Yeah, and so, one thing, yeah, I was gonna say, one thing to add to what Dave said is if you're able to videotape your robot in action, that's also good data that you can show. That, that's yeah, that's my message. Yeah, videotape yeah, make, everything. Videotape <laughs> everything, take pictures, so that way you can show this is what it, it, it did. Exactly. <laughs> All right, well, um, that was a really good introduction to ejecting. We kind of covered everything you need to know, um, but you can always ask questions. Did you have any other question for us? Let's see. I I think we covered all the bases. Okay. Okay, but you can ask. You can send me questions anytime. And uh, uh, no worry, Evan. Did you have a question too? Did um, you just have a question? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Have, we better move on. Yeah, we've got my other team. So I'm going to have to move the computer because in the middle of this one, you're going to hear the announcements come on. And so I'm moving the computer so that it's in a quieter spot. Okay. Didn't, didn't anticipate that one taking quite that long. Yeah. So well, we that just was a to... good introduction and um, important information. So for everyone. Yeah. So, and then uh, I'm going to get one of the kids here to log into their account so they can get your, their presentation up and then we will be ready to roll. So, so they have two teams working on the um, ejecting robot at Gowden High School. Um, yeah. Nancy is in uh, Bozeman, Montana. Oh, um, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll try and get this to plug in. Yeah, and Flo, I'm going to have to jump out at noon because I have uh, another meeting, but then I should be back like uh, 1230. Okay, because um, we might be a little late, but I got Harley coming at noon. Are they coming at noon? They have a project? No, they may. I, I, I may have to look at your list. Yeah, I have Harley at noon. Okay. okay, but you're re you're recording this. So if I, I am, it, I'll go back yeah, yeah. to it. I am recording it. Okay, and so we're gonna have our second team. Uh, one of them's gonna have to leave a little bit early. She's got a uh, AP Bio class. Oh wow! Okay. So, uh, but we have enough time to get started. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing their screen, and then they can go from. Well, I guess once you guys get in, get in frame, and then we're gonna share the screen. You guys know how to use this, right? Yeah. Okay. Share the screen. That's what we're sharing. And here is your slideshow. Okay. Yep. Can you see it all right? Yes. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, we're doing the lunar ejecting robot. Uh, I'm Owen. I'm Kat. 
I'm Lauren. Uh, this is our table of contents. Uh, constraints. The robot needs to weigh no more than 15 ounces. The storage container container on the lander has internal dimensions of four inches by six inches by five inches. Uh, the robot can expand bigger. The robot needs to be able to survive a six foot drop in the sand. Uh, the robot will take a picture of its surroundings, including the lander. The storage container needs to hold the robot in place during the flight from Earth to the moon. And the storage container must release the robot uh, from the lander between two feet to three feet. Uh, research. Uh, Jack's a robot. Uh, it expands to be bigger than when shipped. The sides pushed out and are used to move. Moves by swinging side to side. The wheels on it are oblong. Uh, it has a tail that folds out that helps with balance. Uh, and the camera flips out when needed. And it's roughly the same size and shape as our cr criteria, but it's extremely complex. <laughs> uh, we also looked into rolling balls, uh, clear shell, camera, and electronics would go inside. Uh, we looked at the Jurassic World gyrosphere, which moves via the contact points, which are the red circles, uh, hard to replicate on a small scale. Pros can't be flipped upside down, omnidirectional, simple, uh, less moving parks equals it's less likely to break. Shells protect components inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cons are can't climb steep slopes and the regolith may stick to the shell, which would prevent a photo from being taken. Mm -hmm. I looked into cameras. Uh, like the other group, we thought FPV would be the best because it's cheap, small and light, allows cameras to capture more than one angle. And we also looked in the jumping robox, robots, which are incredibly efficient, uh, both energy and movement. Six times less gravity means it moves six times as far. They're lightweight. Uh, cons could be hard to aim and keep upright. And then this is our prototype. So our general design was two motor, motors attached by a servo, um, which allows turning. The legs connected to the motors. It's simple, lightweight approximately 3.6 ounces um no camera but that's without the camera the oh way. yeah without the camera um it's small approximately 5.5 inches by 2.5 inches by one inch mm. um these were our leg one of our designs for the legs they connect directly to the motor and they cha change connector from the first version um the treads Test, we were testing different shapes for efficiency and maneuverability. We were testing hook and rib tra treads. And the testing we've done so far? Um, these are the different wheels we have used. We made a cardboard one with a rubber band on it. That was the first one. It was lightweight, but it wasn't sturdy. And then we made a laser cut one from chipboard. It was lightweight, but the connection broke. So then we strengthened the connection for the second one. It was stronger, but um, it still doesn't hold the weight as well. And then also it's like too tight for the clearance of the other materials. And then we did a 3D printed one from PLA. Um, it was more sturdy, but the connection needs to be lengthened to allow for clearance. And it could also potentially be heavy. And then those are like our notes from our notebook. And then for prototypes, um, our first one was just like really simple. It had cardboard and like two motors and double A batteries. Um, the pros is just like, it was how we tested out our potential design. However, the motors and batteries were too heavy for the wheels. And then the second one was we used the chipboard wheels um, and a lithium polymer battery. The battery is lighter and the wheels had a stronger connection to the motors. However, um, it was difficult for the battery and breadboard to fit between the wheels when they were moving. And then our final one was with the plastic wheels. Um, it was stronger and could hold the weight better. However, it was still tight fit and they could be heavy. And then questions we have are how far from the lander should the picture be taken? How steep should it be able to climb? Um, should we design the holding and ejecting mechanism, which I believe we got answered? And then also, um, like, does it need to turn and, like, where it needs to turn? So, so um, well, 
my first question to you is, can you explain um, how those wheels are going to move the robot? They, they look almost like legs. Are they, are they making a full rotation? Or... So, so they can't see you, right? Oh, now. So yeah. stop sharing. Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. Let's see. What uh, we yeah, we actually made a simple prototype. Okay. okay, we'll have to hold on a sec here. There you go. Now you can. So can you see that all right? Uh -huh. Yeah. You bet. Uh, full nice. rotation like yeah. this. Oh, there. So like this. So there's times where it could, in theory, be resting on the ground, but then the legs will hit the okay. ground. Okay. Lifting it up again, and then it'll, it'll kind of jump forward. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. That's, that, that's a pretty interesting design. <laughs> I like that. That's really neat. So um, back to your questions. Um, first of all, does it need to turn? Yes, absolutely. Um, when, when you stop to think about this, when it, when it first gets ejected, you're not really going to know the orientation in which it lands. And the, the, the stated objective is that it turns in enough direction to be able to look at the lander as it's coming down. Now, um, in reality, you know that's that's not a factor. But the expectation is, once it lands, it should be able to demonstrate that it can turn essentially in 360 degrees, because you just don't know how far one way or the other it's going to have to go. So that that will be a factor that that you have to build into this. Okay. Um, what were the other questions? I just kind of spaced them out here. Um, I think one was like, how far from like from the lander should it go, and where should like the picture be? How taken? far from the lander? Should yeah, it go? yeah, and 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 again, um, we have we have to put this in into the context of how we're going to demonstrate this for the CDR. Um, so if you think about it. We're, we're essentially creating about a three foot diameter ring that this thing is going to land in. Now, ostensibly, once it comes out of the out of the box, it's going to have some forward motion. Um, how far it actually projects out? Well, it it can't go more than three feet or it's going to land outside of the target zone. And it's going to land on a hard floor, which is probably not a good thing for it, right? So for, for these purposes, again, I would design an ejection system that simply verifies that you clear the box and it will land in the target zone. So whether it, it, it projects out a foot or two feet, that's really not going to be that big of a, of a deal. Now, when we get, if we were actually building this to videotape, for instance, a rocket landing, we'd, we'd want to have some clearance, right? But that's beyond the scope of what you need to concern yourself with. All right. So, I, think, I think I was wondering because um, in the slides at the beginning, it said it had to go like a certain distance away before it took the picture. Like it had to be ejected and then like drive a certain distance away and then turn around and take a picture. So we're yeah, just and and we we've, we've, we've kind of amended um, that. Okay. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, again, I gonna... there's just there's a practical side to this. Yeah. yeah. We, we we can't create an enormous yeah. area for this thing to travel in. So Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say like, land and turn around. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I've been telling my students is just the key thing is to take a picture of the rover and the surroundings. How you do it is okay, but I don't think we're specifying it has to occur while it's being ejected or where. So we're letting that out because, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I, you know, the, the, there are enough design challenges <laughs> in this system, you know, surviving a six foot drop, getting itself oriented. Even being able to show mobility for 30 seconds um, mm -hmm. and take a picture and transmit it, that's, that is a lot to, to accomplish. So again, as I was telling your other team, you know, 
probably the best thing you could do is somebody most likely has access to one of those little plastic kitty waiting points, right? They're usually about 36 inches in diameter. And you can put enough sand in that probably, you know, a, a, a typical bag of sand at a hardware store is about, you know, not even a third of a yard. One bag would probably be enough. Two would absolutely do it. To give yourself, you know, two to three inches of depth on this thing. Um, but then that's your target zone, right? Just build this thing to come out of, uh, you know, off a six foot platform and land mm -hmm. in that target zone. And then within that radius of three feet, you're, you're, you're kind of driving around. Now, whether it pretty much just kind of pivots, you know, could do a, without moving forward, that's, that's entirely yep. up to you. But right. yeah, that's mm -hmm. the... Yeah, so Flo, I'm gonna need to jump out because like I said, I got a 12 to 12.30, but I'll be back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so so again, team, I you know that I'm I'm telling everybody, keep it as simple as you can. It's it this is a complex build, right? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Um, given that this has to run autonomously, right? You don't you don't get to power this. You're going to have some kind of a board in there. Um, have you? What What are your thoughts there? Are you using a like a Raspberry Pi and Arduino? Yeah. Um. So far, we are planning on using a Raspberry Pi. Perfect. We also have a camera that attaches to that. Absolutely. And more importantly, how about your coding skills? Have you guys done some some coding so that you can program that board? to carry out these functions? Uh, I haven't, but last year we did work on a autonomous uh, ping pong ball delivery system. So I have experience with the hardware. hardware. Okay, so, and, and, and again, uh, this, this becomes a critical piece at some point. My suggestion to you is, you know, find a recruit. You know, there. I mean, do you have like a first robotics team in your school, um, you you probably got some some software programming classes that are offered, right? Yeah, I think I think Kat, the the, yeah. the girl that left, she's she's in the coding classes. So yeah, I I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting some outside help on this. Yeah, that, <laughs> we we know that that would be a challenge. <laughs> yeah, so I I would I would start finding somebody now. <laughs> just so that you get them on board. <laughs> I love your comments, Dave. Those are so important. So it gives you a great direction to move on and to know how to test it and everything. And actually, Rochester Institute of Technology has volunteered their software students to help you. So I will send you an email introducing you to Michael Frank at Rochester Institute of Technology. And he has students that will help our uh, students know, learn about coding if you want. So um, that, you know, the, yeah, the, yeah. What, one other suggestion as well. Um, we've already held the, the, an in-person preliminary review in Colorado. Um, we have, we have, quite a few schools participating here. And I was really impressed by the fact that fully half of the reviewers who showed up, and we had more than 30 reviewers over three days, were former Hunt students, right? Many of these, they're out of college now, they're in their careers, but they still consider Hunch to be an integral part of how they got to where they are. And they're very enthusiastic about sharing their knowledge and skills with other people. I would suggest if your teacher has been doing this for a while, there are probably people in your area who worked with, who were part of this program before, and they're a great resource to look at as well, right? You might find somebody who's living you know, somewhere not very far from you who does this professionally, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were to contact them and tell them what you're doing, 
who knows? They might just be willing to help you a lot more than you can imagine. So <laughs> take take advantage of that. There are a lot of Hunch alumni out there. That's a great suggestion because I know um, some of them are there at, at MSU, actually. They're right in Bozeman. Um, Absolutely. So that's, that's a really good suggestion, too. Um, so the only one thing I want to add to that discussion is when you are testing, you need to be aware that that sand or whatever could interfere with your camera. So yeah. somehow you have to make sure. I, I I always want kids to work on that issue because I know it's a big issue sending anything to space. So I think just that's another question we had, we didn't put it on the slideshow, but if you guys had any ways of like um, keeping the camera from getting sand on it, and like any um, suggestions on how we might do that. So I'm depending on you guys to come up with some good ways. I don't know, Dave, do you have any suggestions? Well, I, you know, I, I think that that's going to be important. And, you know, what, what I would suggest doing again, and I made this comment to the other team, you, I think one of the things you have to do as soon as you can is start doing some drop testing, right? Just get a, get a basic shell of your, of your robot and begin testing how well it withstands that. Don't put any of your components in it yet, right? Just add some some weight to compensate for motors and the camera and the Arduino, et cetera, because you just want to, you, you need to know whether what you have printed is going to withstand that impact. And not just one time, but multiple times, right? Um, with the idea of the camera itself, I I would even just suggest, you know, trying to cover it with a film, of, you know, like clear plastic, at least initially. And then you might be able to add something into that as well. Part of it is you still got to have, you know, good clarity there. But, you know, the, the reality is um, a small piece of Lexan or something like that that just kind of serves as a protective window is probably a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it's smart not to put your camera in when you're initial testing, like, like <laughs> Dave said, because that's expensive and we don't want to ruin it. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, you can always ask me questions. If I don't know the answer, I could ask Dave or Glenn on that. So, mm -hmm. so thank you so much. Um, everyone at, at Gallatin High School, you're doing a great job. We really appreciate it. Um, so happy Halloween, too, by the way. <laughs> awesome. All right. So we're going to move to the other school in Montana, to Billings Career Center. Um, and they're right here where I live in, in Billings. Uh, thank you for your patience. We're running a little bit late here. But um, I hope you've been listening because uh, Dave's been giving some really important advice on this ejecting robot. We have. Okay, good. <laughs> Introduce yourselves and then sh uh, show us what you have. Okay. Uh, my name is Jacob Barone. I'm Tavon Hurd. And I'm Dylan King. Uh, so we're at Billings Career Center uh, doing the lunar ejection robot, uh, and at the start of our project, we thought we were going to do kind of standard wheel design. Uh, specifically, we're going to do water wheel design. So you see in our from the top top right there, we have the kind of water wheel. Uh, those flaps are how uh, sand wheels today are are made. Uh, well, that's the design. So if you have like a dune buggy, it's going to have a wheel like that. Uh, we thought we were going to do that because it's pretty easy to make one unflippable. Kind of like the picture on the bottom, we make really big wheels that allow the puggy not to be able to flip. Uh, and also, they work great on Earth. Um, then after a brief consultation with our team, we split up with uh, into the individual brainstorming. Uh, in that brainstorming, we made over 130 different ideas in Google Docs. Uh, one of those ideas was to make a helical wheel. Uh, when we came together in our group, we came up with a list of ideas that we kind of all agreed on. Uh, 
the biggest one was the outer wheel, uh, the helical wheel, the screw wheel, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the next slide now. So a standard wheel, uh, when it gets into the finer, finer dust, the regular form on a, either in, on Earth or on the Moon, it just kind of spins uh, because the sand doesn't have it's really loose, so it doesn't have much of a wheel to push off of. Uh, so with an, the screw wheel, the helical wheel, uh, you can the auger kind of compacts that sand and allows it to propel it forward. Auger wheels are also omnidirectional, so with two of them, depending on which way you spin these, it can move side to side or forward and back, um, extremely easy. Uh, it, it's also very simple. So without the, like four wheels, if you want to do four wheels, there's a lot of moving parts there. We only have two wheels, two motors, and a battery. It's very simple. Uh, it doesn't, it's pretty hard to break one of these. Uh, is that video playing? It's no. just play automatically. Um, yes, the, if you go up, up on that one at the bottom, it's a video. Uh, that uh this is a russian made vehicle the same type of wheels uh it can go through sand mud uh snow with ease it uh it was uh very very good in sand there, there's actually a mining company who uses these wheels for this uh very mm -hmm. fine sand and mud uh it just helps us um one main reason why with these wheels uh you can go to the next slide now, Jerry. Sure. Yeah, so the Stauber wheels, they, uh, they're just very good for what we're going to do. Uh, instead of getting stuck, these wheels will have an even much bigger surface area, which allows it to kind of float to the top of the sand. Uh, yeah. All right. So as we're getting into, like, we passed the mechanical part of it, like the the overview. Uh, now let's get into the like the electronic part of it. Uh, we at first thought we were going to use some form of 360 camera because that allows us to take a picture of everything, including the lander. Uh, but those things are bulky, they're incredibly expensive, and they use a lot of memory, which means we'd have to use a lot more boards, a lot more components, which would increase weight. And we want to keep that as low as possible and as simple as possible. Um, to combat this, we we're thinking of putting the camera, a smaller camera, on the top of the robot on some form of rotating platform, whether it be a planetary gear, standard gear, or whatever, uh, in order to just rotate the camera as we need. That also means we don't really have to turn the robot around. We have to turn the camera so that it, we can take a picture of the lander, which cuts down multiple motors, uh, a lot of coding, and a lot of different components and possibly weight, depending on how we design it. Um, as, for, as far as boards will go, um, we'll most likely be using the Arduino Uno Wi-Fi Rev4. It has a built-in ESP32 S3 chip, which allows us to connect to it via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, which means it'll be able to easily send it to one of our phones or one of our computers here at the Career Center. Uh, it has a pretty decent memory, thanks to the two processors on there. Um, and it has the same operating voltage as well as the same like floor plan as the Arduino Uno Rev3 without the Wi-Fi, which means it's compatible with almost any other Arduino product. Um, alongside that, we'll most likely be using the Arduino Motor Control Shield, which allows us to control two to four DC motors, which would allow us to control both of the vehicle wheels as well as the rotating gear on top. Um, as far as the camera goes, we were thinking about the uh, FPV camera as well, but those are large. They eat a lot of memory due to the resolution, and they're very hard to interface with Arduino. So instead, um, we've chosen the ArduCam Mini OV2640. Uh, it's very small, decent resolution, um, and it's also compatible still with compressed J JPEG files, which means it'll be easy for a phone, a computer, anything to open without any extra software. Uh, prototyping. So, uh, we first started out with a very box-like design, but clearly that is going to leave us with, like, very little room to, like, make us some sort of, like, we planned on, like, a case to seal it in so it could survive the fall. Uh, so, we sort of, like, cut down on that. 
And here you can see how we split into two different designs. If you could switch this slide. Uh, our first sort of design was uh, what I call MIW, or motor inside wheel. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Our idea was to put the motor inside of the wheel because then it would put more weight on the wheels and allow it to dig into the ground a lot easier uh, and free up space for circuitry because we have to make this automated. We have to code like a camera rotating and uh, the, of course, the movement is somewhat complicated. Uh, but there are some problems with that. First of all, the motors we were using, we don't know which type. Uh, they're they're pretty standard, scratched up. Pretty motors. Uh, they don't have enough torque. If you put your finger on, like, to stop it, it halts and it strikes. Uh, second off, uh, it supports, like, a lot more weight than we need. And it also makes our diameter less ridiculous and sort of, like, expands too much, which if we want to make that shell design, uh, we need as much space as we can get. Uh, so to combat this, uh, we came up with this uh, in motors inside the body design. Uh, it works with like a drive belt design. Uh, we planned on like uh, some sort of chain, but here we are using rubber bands for that. Uh, of course, this does like cut down on like how much space we have inside the body, but you know we've like had plans to like cut down on like the huge like pad that we have for our circuitry frame and our mm -hmm. battery frame, yeah, and uh, that's where we are now. Okay, so now you guys can show your actual. Yeah, if you want to cut to that thing, I can. So I don't know if we lost you. Could stop sharing. Dave, did you lose them? Um, I, I see that they're still online with. Um, they switched Sam at the Billings Career Center, but I think they tried to switch something there. Yeah, they see. did. They tried to switch from uh, here. Yeah. They come again. They, Hi. There we go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I accidentally closed them out, I think. But we're back in. You guys have right up to the PowerPoint now. I'll let them show their actual. Program. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. We tried to do quick recovery there. Yep. You know, they, can, they can hear you up here. But, and we can see see the so, prototype. So, yeah, dinky little prototype. It has a grossly oversized power plant. That's uh, just six, 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 six double A's put together, uh, and two in way oversized motors. Uh, we were using parts that we had left over from previous Hunch projects. So what you see here is not the uh, components that we'll be using in the final product. Everything is still on order or ready to be ordered. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just a proof concept. Um, here on the bottom is our helical wheel design that we were speaking of. Uh, it doesn't function very well on like flat, solid <clears throat> Just kind of spins because that's nothing to eat into. On sand, though, it does very well because it can bite into it. Uh, actually, actually, power that works. Right now, we are just using rubber bands as the belt because it's what we had on hand. But we do intend to move to a more uh, belt or chain like design in the future. Um, here are like smaller models or different models of those wheels that are on there, just so you can. See them. There we go. Hey, uh, just so you can actually like see them off the body. I think that's pretty much everything. Yeah, I'm to take this back up with you yeah. in case they want to show you there, and I'll switch back over to you again. Yeah. Interesting wheel design from from the Russian Russian trucks that work in sand. Okay, so do you have any questions for us to begin with? Right, so you said that uh, this is like, doesn't have a lot of weight to it and the lunar lander is probably using some kind of thruster to like slow itself down, correct? Yeah. Can you see that again? 
So the lunar lander is using some kind of thruster to like slow itself down. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, is there a chance that that like blows our bottom lane? Yes, Save. there is that chance, but not from your prototype design, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? It, that again, you know, this kind of goes back to this notion of how far do we want to eject this thing? Um, for our purposes right now, the distance isn't going to be great. Um, as long as you clear the box, you're going to be dropping into a zone of about three feet in diameter, and that's all you need to hit. Don't concern yourself with thrusters on an actual rocket, right? Uh, that, that's beyond your design challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions for us? Um, so... So I do have a I do have a question for Dave actually. Dave, if their camera rotates um the 360 degrees, do should they still make sure that their robot rotates? Well, yeah, I I, I personally think having a camera that can swivel is a great idea, right? For a number of reasons. The, if you if you think about it, we can't predict what the terrain is going to be like. And even, you know, if, if you land on something or, you know, part of your mechanism of driving this either gets damaged or you get hung up on a rock, the fact that you can still turn that camera and point it at whatever you want to is a smart idea. Now, that being said, there is a design requirement that this thing be able to drive itself, right? So, you know, you, you still have to have that as a part of your design. So, okay? besides moving 30 seconds, you still need to t have it turn. You can. Uh, if, you, if you spin them opposite ways or the same way, it can move side to side or up on also turn, kind of like tank. So they, they can turn whatever way it wants to be. Also, yeah, also it, and, and in reality, if you stop to think about it, if if you just, if you locked up one of those two screws and turned the other one, it's gonna, it's gonna pivot, right? I mean, in, unless you just don't have enough traction and it's just sitting there spinning dirt. But, you know, when you think about it, a lot of treaded vehicles like tractors and tanks use that kind of mechanism depending upon how sharp a turn they want to do they can lock up one side of this and just drive it with the other and they'll pivot basically on a 90 degree turn so yeah there's there's a lot of ways for you to accomplish that but what what i'm getting at with the idea of having the camera pivot you've got redundancy there i and and that's a smart thing to do it really is. Now, you may be able to point the whole robot by driving it to the direction you want. But again, if something happens and you're unable to turn the full robot, but you can still spin the camera, you're you're accomplishing the, the primary admission objective. Okay. So I like what you're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay, any other questions for us? Uh, did you have one? I think I'm good. Good? Uh, yeah, I think yep. All yeah. right. Thank you. All right. No, All right. thank you so much. Nice that, presentation, that is, guys. Yep, really yeah. nicely done. And I like your engineering books also. Um, so, and, and I'm interested to see that's a unique design for the wheels. I like that you did research and found something that could go in sand well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, happy Halloween to you. <laughs> I hope I hope it's a little warmer tonight. The sun is out, so it should be a good evening. Um, but we're going to move on, and you can stay with us. We're going to move on to New York and uh, Harley.
<laughs> we got more stain. Uh, I got a history test to do. So. <laughs> but I'm, re I'm gonna record it so you. I'll I, make sure you get the link. All right, that was our second question. Uh, where can we find these uh, videos? I'll give you the link, but it's on the NASA hunch, um, NASA hunch .com. You scroll down to the YouTube link and then look on playlist. It will say 2024 PDR. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good Halloween. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for your patience. Of course. All right, Harley, you are up. Good, uh, good morning. Oh. Uh, this, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Fritz Cass. Hi. Nice we, we take, we take Halloween very seriously at Harley. I warn you, some people are going to be in costume and there you have it. <laughs> uh, we have, we have two presentations. Um, I'm going to, uh, get the first one up and we're, um, and I will share my screen and then I can, um, I can, uh, no, no. Uh, be first. Perfect. Uh, We're not and then uh, I will share these with you Wait, later. Oh, I guess okay, so. so Harley is in Rochester, New York. It is. Yes. Do you uh, do you know Rochester? I visited. Uh, do... I visited all your students when you were gone. So. <laughs> right. Hang on. Share screen. Here we. And Nancy is not with us right now, but she said. She... She had a meeting and she'll join as soon as her meeting is off if we're still talking. Is that going to be a problem? Because it's fine. It has to update. Oh, nope. we haven't. Yeah, we, 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 have, we just fixed our slide a little bit and it hasn't updated yet. It won't update. It won't yeah. update. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. There, there, there might be a, there might be, there are a couple of late ads that you might get in, uh, in, uh, Uh, in uh, when I forward it. All right, sharing. There we go. All right, and guys, you can just tell me when to forward it. All right, we're going to start with Danny, Andrew, and Brody. You guys raise your hands, say hi. Hello. Hi. All right. Okay, um, we see your screen perfectly. Okay. Should we can... start talking? Yep, yes. Start talking. Yep. Um, our idea was to use a rover type design that moves with three wheels. Um, the materials we'll use include aluminum and specialized carbon fiber that will be able to survive on the moon, deal with radiation, and survive on the trip to the moon. It will be powered using batteries, um, maybe a little bit rather due to the fact that we won't, uh, have to worry about, we won't have to worry about it, uh, like having to have it charged or whatever. So, yeah. LiPo batteries might explode though, so we might have to find an alternative yeah. to that. So. Uh, there's also weight problems. We have to keep it pretty light. Uh, that, that might be an issue, but that's why we'll be using stuff like aluminum and carbon fiber. So it'll stay light and try and keep the design smaller. Yeah. You know? Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so we've all played with some remote uh, control. You Go next. Yeah, that's the next slide. This is next. Yeah, we oh. see the R design slide now. Uh, You're good. So we've all played with the remote control cars as children, and our our design is pretty pretty similar because it's good to keep it simple. Like you you have less errors when it's simple. Uh, but we we've had several ideas that we're still deciding between. Yeah, uh, we. We know we're going to have three of wheels or three legs, but we with the wheels, there are issues with uh, traction and everything, which is why we're also considering using legs, maybe. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you know, like from Star Wars, the spider droids, basically something like that. Like, it'll walk around like a spider sort of. Yeah. Um, yeah, for coding and such, and such, uh, we're hopefully going to make it so that it's fully autonomous because human error is a very big, uh, important part of this. Because if, like, maybe one of us accidentally presses the wrong button on the control pad or whatever, it could accidentally, like, move into a different area. So that's why we want to make sure it's, like, 
pretty autonomous. Obviously, we'll still have some human input into it, but for the most part, it's like autonomous. Um, the camera will have to be really small. We've we we um we've been looking at them, and there are some like very tiny ones that we're probably gonna be using. Um, the we plan to have something so that the camera can rotate around and view uh, from view in all directions and something so that it, uh, never mind. Uh, it, I, an alternative to that, we could just have the robot, uh, what's it called, rotate itself. Yeah. That's another option that might be simpler and have less uh, issues with dust. But yeah, um, for the charge, I know we do have to have it like moving around for an hour. So we're gonna, but we understand that also having too many batteries might be the worst, uh, might be not very good. So we're most likely going to figure out a way that it can only or that it lasts for like an hour, an hour, 30 minutes or whatever, uh, in, just in case like, and yeah. And that's pushing this. Yeah. But if it'll be lightweight and small, then that, a smaller battery should last for pretty long. Yeah. Especially since with, with the reduced gravity, I think there will be less strain and I, I'm not sure. All right. Uh, yeah, one of our main concerns is definitely the materials being uh, lightweight. We did talk about aluminum and carbon fiber, but those things like carbon fiber, it's kind of hard to get the specific material that we want on the internet. We've been definitely been looking at it up. So we might have to, might have to find like a replacement but for the most part, if like we can actually find like a good carbon fiber that that works to our specifications, it can definitely, you know, it, we'll definitely use that. And yeah. Next. 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 Um, our timeline is October is presenting ideas, getting feedback from you guys. November design and prototype. The prototype should be done by the end of the month. We unfortunately don't have like a physical thing or anything because it's been a little tough with a lot of stuff happening here. Um, December design and prototype, final prototype after like slight testing should be done. And then January, after January, it's just testing and revising, making sure it's the best possible. Now, uh, for the PowerPoint, we did, we weren't able to, we had a slide that we prepared about what we had before this, but unfortunately it wasn't able to be pushed through. So we, we it won't be up there, but if you guys don't mind, we're going to just, I'll just read it out. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so other ideas we had, at first we thought about using a jumping robot that would use like a motor to twist a string, which would then create kinetic energy, causing it to soar into the air. Uh, it, it was like, we, it was, there was a, um, uh, it was from a video we saw from some people and it was, it was able to jump incredibly high. It was on the NASA Hunch page. That's yeah. That's where we got our idea. Mm -hmm. so Could you stop sharing? Oh, sorry. Could you stop sharing so that we can see you? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, so that's that's one idea we had, but we, it was scrapped because we couldn't find the necessary materials to create it. We had to find a very specific type of material, and yeah, it's like a, it's like a weird type of carbon fiber. And then also, also uh, it's hard to control, on the right? Because it's like it just ju it jumps real very high, but it's also right. kind of hard to like move it around and stuff so that it can actually move in that direction. Another idea we had was a simple four wheeler, but a multitude of problems arose when we looked at it. Like the traction, obviously, that's going to be a little tough. Um, the wheels could get like the motors inside of the wheels; they could get like um, dust in them from like moon dust or sand or whatever inside of it. And along with the fact that it seemed a little too boring for what is NASA hunch, and I know, like we're supposed to be innovative here, and I just thought, you know, it's just a four wheeler. Anybody can make that. So that's so we decided to scrap that as well. And yeah, that's awesome. it. Awesome. Okay. Um. So, uh, what your plan? I see is your timeline. I like that you have that so that you can be on task on knowing what you can do. And uh, hopefully um, you'll watch the other presentations on this ejecting robot and listen to all the great advice that Dave has given you on exactly what it has to do. Like you put down one hour for your batteries. Well, the robot really only has to 
um, operate for 30 seconds now. So um, keep checking the the updates on the robot because he keeps updating it. So you don't have to operate for an hour. If you if you jump out of the lander, land your six feet into a sand that pit that's three feet in diameter, um, move away a little bit from the lander, turn around, take a picture, you're good. That's more like 30 seconds than an hour. So don't worry about your batteries. Also, your your material. You can make it out of anything if anything you have handy, but you it's good you're researching the carbon fiber and the aluminum because those are good materials that you should actually um, tell NASA, this is what the material is we want you to make it out of, right? So don't worry about getting the carbon fiber and the aluminum. Make it out of cardboard if you want, or 3D printed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's um, listen yeah. to what Dave has to say. Dave. Well, yeah. you know, it, I, I want to dovetail on a couple of things here. Um, obviously, we, we have put some revisions into the project requirements, but it is important to understand, you know, and I can't stress this enough. You guys need to document all of your testing. As soon as you start building and doing any part of your testing, whether it's just dropping this, um, whether it's showing mobility, et cetera. An example, for instance, um, at the critical review, the demonstration is basically you're going to have a, a tower six feet high that you put your robot and box on top of, and then it ejects out into essentially around a three foot diameter um, target zone. Now, if you're testing, right, and you're able to document the fact that you can drive around in that circle, well, a three foot diameter, uh, or I mean, yeah, a three foot diameter has a circumference of what, right? How many laps would you mm -hmm. actually have to do in this target mm -hmm. to equal a hundred feet? Over time, you're probably going to document all of that. Similarly, you're going to document the fact that your battery has enough power to keep this thing going for a period of time. So have that there as, as a source. The bottom line is, no matter what battery you use to power this, that's probably not what NASA would use for a lunar vehicle. So you're just establishing proof of concept, right? Stick with those requirements. And again, do the research that says, this is what we'd like to build it out of eventually. But your task is formidable enough. Um, you've got a pretty good group there. Is anybody in your group um, skilled or have any um, experience in doing the programming for this robot? Well, not really. We don't have anybody who knows anything about it. Okay. So again, one of the things that, that I want to stress is if you don't have anybody in your group, you need to start recruiting. Go find someone who can help you because you're still going to have to do all of the programming on a laptop and then upload that into whatever board you're going to use, whether it be, you know, a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, et cetera. Um, and that's something you should probably start looking into now because <laughs> you, need to, you need to make the people aware of all of the things they have to be able to do to make this robot function autonomously. And they're right at Rochester, New York. So they have... Um, yeah, you've got a lot of resources. Yeah. I will yeah. send you the letter that Michael Frank sent asking our hunch schools to contact them to 
as a resource for learning the Arduino and, and the computer programming. Yeah, so I, and I would perfect. just say, guys, the sooner the better, you know, get somebody on board. You're probably going to find someone who's going to go, this is really cool. I want to help. Yeah. But a desire to help is not the same as finding the time. Right. We have to we have to understand that you might be working with some undergraduate or grad student or somebody on the faculty. They're doing a lot of things. Right. You, you, so don't don't wait. I'm, I'm encouraging you to get out there and find somebody as soon as possible that can help you with that vital part of this project. You can build an awesome robot, but if it's not programmed, you're kind of dead in the water. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's a wonderful skill to learn. So uh, I'm glad that that you are interested in doing this project and will learn how to program. It's really a lot of fun too. Absolutely. So, so are all? I see that there are six students there. Is yes, there we two? Have, yeah, we have. Yeah, we have two teams. And two I'm, teams. I'm ready for the ready cool. ready to uh, fire up the second one here. Okay. Good. All right. Very good. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me die. Yay. And oh, are there graphics in this thing? And yeah. Oh my gosh. They're graphics. You guys are so advanced. All right, <laughs> here we go. This is group two. You can see this screen, okay? Uh, yes. Yes. All right, good. Here we go. Okay. So our concept with this robot was if you have a small amount of track and a lot of belly with no tread on it, you're going to slip out and you won't, and you'll get stuck on a rock that pokes up a little. So the idea was to essentially make the entire robot tread. So, and this would also allow it to work what flipped over because a tread wraps around the entire robot. So it doesn't matter if your front's up, your back's up and it'll go to the one of the tracks. So, uh, here, can you click it? A Just advance times. all Keep going. So we're, we wanted to make sure that it could autonomously drive so that a human wouldn't have to manually control it. But systems can fail, and the number one priority is making sure that we can get the snapshot. So we have autonomous driving, but uh, can you click again? We're also, and one more time, sorry. We also have uh, two different radio signals for redundancy in case anything is to fail. We can make sure that we are able to position the robot and take the picture. Um, and so we use a single board computer operating a microcontroller uh, uh, to control our motors. The single board computer is a Linux-based operating system, whereas the microcontroller runs a, op uh, runs a system called Circuit Python. Uh, and we have programming experience here with working with a little bit of our major open source projects, IT work, as well as other robotics teams. Uh, and the reason we're do and the reason is this gives us redundancy because the microcontroller, if it because the microcontroller can control the motors and the single board computer can also control parts. So we have individual components in case one of them fails, the other one can take over. Advanced, please. Everything. And everything here is 3D printed with few moving parts to ensure durability unless we for error. In addition, we can also reprint the parts in case anything fails. And that's what 3D printing this magic is, is that it allows you to precisely recreate that part in case anything has a problem. And the two different parts of the two robot's brain can, well, the microcontroller, which controls the motor and some radio signals, whereas the uh, single board computer, a Raspberry Pi, it controls the cameras and other radio signals because it's it, it's a little bit more powerful. So they can talk to each other and they can tell each other what's going on with the motors, the radio, the camera, everything. So it can know what's happening and adapt. One of our challenges that with this is that there is dust on the moon and we need to make sure that dust doesn't penetrate into parts that could be compromised by it. The motors, if dust gets into the motors, this could it could cause extra drag and wear down the motors and or increase battery load and it can cause huge problems. So the treads, 
are going to be almost entirely sealed. We'll have them driven from the inside, but we're going to have bristles. We might have bristles to make sure that dust stays out while still allowing gears to spin. So traction, to fix this problem, we're gonna use rubberized treads with large prongs to dig into the earth. The treads will go over most of the entire robot and there will be a small slit down the middle of these treads to allow for a camera and potentially a pop-up camera that could be able to spin around to, picture, to take any picture. Thus, it would provide enough traction and we'd have a good spot to look out of. So another one of our big problems was navigation. And this is what we struggle with because on a typical robot, you can use a compass to see where there's north, where south, and where you came from. However, because we're on the moon, we don't have a compass, and so we cannot use it. And as we recently found out, we cannot use it in the final competition. So we will do our best with encoders and stepper motors to ensure that we're getting the right amount of stuff. And we've thrown out the idea of light vision here and there of seeing if stuff is aligned. We're probably not going to do that. However, that's still an option, and we're still investigating what our best option would be to correctly position our robot and make sure it goes the right way, while also allowing it to see where the whole base is. Advance, please. So these were the ideas. The sketch on the far left is representing how the gear will drive the tread. The idea is that the tread covers up the only the opening on the robot. And in addition, underneath the tread, they'll be felt to reduce the drag that the treads will have on the robot, while in addition, also providing a barrier. Because it only has to go. <laughs> I didn't touch anything. Okay, all right, go ahead. All right, here we go. Because <laughs> it only has to go 100 feet. This will hold out the dust for 100 feet. And we have the motor on a smaller gear, so we have more torque and less speed. And, and, and actually, these um, and these preliminary sketches are great, but we're actually going to have one of the team members uh, share his yes, screen. I can so I'm going to stop sharing mine. They have a... Um, um, I can show you our CAD model. Yeah, so. they have a CAD model that I think uh, in 3D that really brings this to life. So, um, oh, good. Okay, so here is our model. And in here, so this is just a pretty much a sketch in 3D form. So we have um, right here in the front, this is a little hole. This will be with clear plastic so that we can see through it. And there's the camera right in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then around here, um, oops. in here we have the electronics. This is one of the motors. We don't have the other one in because this is just a, to give an idea. This is our Pi that will be managing the camera and talking to the microcontroller, which controls the motors. <laughs> And you can see here our gear design, where we will have the gear protruding out of the top and bottom so that it can drive the tread around. Hmm. We also plan to have another camera on this back part once it is closed off so that no matter which direction it is facing, it will still be able to take a picture. And we were also considering the idea of having a camera that can pop out of the top in order to make sure that it can take a snapshot what, no matter what direction it's facing. So multiple cameras is what you're talking about. Yes. Awesome. Motorized parts always have a chance of failure and so having multiple cameras is redundant too. Yes. That's good. Especially because cameras are so important. Cheap. Yeah. Well, and so cheap now, putting three of them on is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And since the entire goal of the robot is to take a picture, it's pretty yeah, important that the cameras out. work. Sure. So, one suggestion um, for this team you, you talked about using essentially a rubberized tread. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. So for your prototype, that's fine. In fact, that, that makes a lot of sense. But rubber is not going to be an option for an actual lunar rover. 
Oh, and, and, you know, my, minus, minus 250 degrees, even a vulcanized rubber is with, it would just shatter, right? So, so you need to with, do a little bit of research on what you would use as an alternative to that. So with the, in an environment where we can't use rubber, we were also thinking of the idea of having little, like individual parts that like slide past each other with protrusion so that it can still get a grip even if it doesn't have uh-huh uh-huh um, yeah and, uh, and and that works but but again it's you know it's just i i think for for your prototype stay with what you've got this that's not a bad design at all right <laughs> and, and this is more just the research component for this um we we're, we don't have to deal with you know, essentially about a 500 degree Fahrenheit temperature swing between hot and cold on Earth. But the moon's, uh, it, it it's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, for the CDR, can we use um, rubber treads? Like are we like- Absolutely, yes. you bet you can. Okay, good. And, and if you guys can find something that's already commercially available that fits your purposes, go for it. Yeah. We were actually looking at using um, Lego treads. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. That There's nothing wrong with that at all. You bet. But you should do some research and see what material that NASA should use for those treads. Mm -hmm. But you can use whatever you have handy to, to make your model. All right, nice job, guys. You uh, any uh, other follow-on questions for um, oh. the NASA team? I was just wondering where can we find the recording of this? Oh, so I will put it on the NASA Hunch. Um, so go to nasahunch.com. That's our website. Scroll all the way down to the YouTube link, and then you have to click on playlist, and there'll be a there'll be a playlist for. 2024 um, PDRs, and that's where you will find all of, I, I'll list it because we're doing by project. So today we'll be the ejecting robot. However, I'm not sure I'm gonna get it on until the weekend because I got so much to do, but I'm gonna just put it on um, on on that YouTube. And you all did your registration, right? Because I need to we'll be all sure. up to date on that. Yes. Awesome. Okay. That is really cool. Uh, nice presentations, guys. And I'll make sure that Nancy Hall has this because Nancy is your mentor. And I think you have a question. Uh, yes. Can, so since we can't use a compass for autonomous navigation, is it okay if we just eyeball it with encoders? Because the problem is one wheel could lose traction and it could spin. Without a compass, we have no way of knowing which way we're pointing. Are we allowed to just assume that we're going to keep traction? Because we have no way of knowing which way we're pointing without a compass. But yes. You're not You're not going to be able to control the robot, though. I mean, by, by eyeballing it, you're kind of implying that you want to be able to, to initiate some command to tell it which way to point. Uh, we were thinking as it let as it started as it was about to be ejected, mm -hmm. the compass would zero that, but we're not allowed to right. use the compass. And then you could so, say plus so ninety drive that he, way. Here, here's a couple of of suggestions, and this is not something that you guys need to worry about building into your prototype. But you're right, uh, a, a standard magnetic compass won't work. But you could use uh, you could use an IR sensor. You could use a thermal sensor. When you think about it, the, the objective here is you want to point this in the direction of a rocket that is landing on the surface of the moon. So there's going to be a lot of heat, right? Anything that can pick up that signature would, would work. Now, that's, that's beyond what you need to design into what you're doing, right? So all all right. ours has to do is drive straight. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. North, south, and east, west don't matter. It's only it's it's like the black pearl or whatever, right? You need a compass yeah. that yeah. pointing at what you want. So just run exactly. both motors forward at okay. at fifty percent for thirty seconds for thirty seconds. Right. Exactly. 
But it has to. But it should turn. Thanks so much. It should turn, though, right, Dave? Yeah, it'll turn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah they, it, it will turn. Right. Okay. Uh, arbitrary compass okay. point is it, it needs to be able to turn and face the rocket. Okay. We were just worried that it would slip and maybe it wouldn't turn perfectly straight because we wouldn't be able to know whether we're driving straight after it slipped out. But if we just have to drive straight, that's, that's also fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Good. I remember that question about the compass. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work on the moon. <laughs> well, okay. thank you so much. Um, don't forget to get some lunch yourselves. I got to get these guys uh, to that. Okay, thank you for your patience. I know we ran out. Dave, you did a tremendous job. Thank you all and happy Halloween. Uh, Dave, can you come back this in uh, about an hour? How many, how many more teams do you have? I, I have another... Um... I've, I've got one team that I'm meeting with virtually in Colorado at 2.15 our time. Okay. No, I have a, the 11.45 Fairport in New York and then Frontier in New York at 12.15 our time. So, so I only have two 11, then. 11.45 our time? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. I'll, awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll be back on at 11.45. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. I All really right. appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.